and then we'll share it later on. Um, feel free to um, keep your um, image up on your screen or if you prefer to, you're, you're very welcome to um, stop your video. Um, I'm going to introduce Claire and her practice briefly and then she's going to take us through a demonstration and a talk about her work. Um, so I, Claire, just before we start, did you want to um, save questions to the end? Well, I'm quite happy if you want to strike up a conversation as we go along. And I would say um, this is the first time I've attempted to do this. So I would be grateful if you could say to me, you know, about the angle of the camera, you know, when I am demonstrating and showing you, because I'm not sure. So because I want you to see the best that you can see. Oh, <laughs> so uh, well, thank this you. is an all new kind of thing. But no, I'm, I'm happy, you know, to have a conversation about what I'm doing, because what, what I thought I would do is um, just show you my studio and I've got um, a selection of the pigments um, out that I use, uh, just, just a few, and then I was going to demonstrate with one pigment that I'm using quite a lot at the moment, uh, so the work, uh, series of works behind me. And then um, I was going to hopefully, if it works, to share my screen with you um, to show you how I use uh, the pigments within in the paintings and the different surfaces and grounds that, that, I, that I use. So it's going to be a bit of both um, live and on, on screen. Okay. Okay. So, I'll, I'll just introduce you, Claire, and then I've made you co-host so you can take over. Um, so, Claire Thatcher is a painter living and working in Thornbury, South Gloucestershire. She's exhibited nationally and internationally, and her work is in a number of private collections. Claire's practice is deeply connected to a sense of place located in coastal and tidal areas. She's interested in particular landscape features that have a profound effect on her. The locations she chooses and the focus of her attention is highly selective and personal, evoking a, a very strong emotional felt response. Claire uses drawing and painting, making oil paints using pure pigments, selecting a limited palette she has felt when in a place. And it's this, as um, Claire explained, which will be her focus today of her demonstration and talk. Over to you. Right, okay. So welcome to my studio. Um, I can just show you an in context where we are. So we're on the first floor and my studio has got, as you see, beautiful natural light, lots of windows and quite a nice space. And, and these are the paintings, serious paintings that I'm working on and drawings currently, uh, which are related to my trip to Alaska last year. Uh, over here is a bit of storage area. These are my panels. If you, I'm going to be talking about how I prepare these. So if you want to have a look, this is the gesso surface on the plywood panels that I make to seal the surface before then working on top. And a drawing I have up. So this is an example of the large scale drawings that I work up from sketchbook drawings I've made whilst on location, a few of my books. And now here, round here, are my pigments. So this is a particular and integral part of what I, I do. So I thought I would share that with you today. Um, I was introduced to working with pigments uh, when I was on my degree course. And we have here um, at the back some earth-like pigments and spectral-like colour pigments here. Um, I source them, I get them either from um, A.P. Fitzpatrick or Cornella, Cornellison's. And I have a Sennelia one here as well. Um, and they do vary in price as well, depending on, on the pigment. So the earth colours tend to be um, less expensive. For example, here we have a, uh, 
bohemian green earth. So, so I've, when it's not so much money, I, I tend to buy a kilo. So this is 16.95, for example. We've got a, a slate grey green. Look at that. A kilo, well, 750 grams, six pounds fifty, and it really goes, you know, a, a long way. And I, I, I do believe uh, working with the pigments, it, it is less expensive. Um, it turns out to be than um, paint and tube. Um, of course, I, I do uh, use uh, tube paint as well in, in, in the work. So I've got a uh, selection here. I've got Le Franc, uh, there's a Wallace Seymour, uh, Michael Harding, all good quality paints. Um, so if you just go over here, um, this is where I make my pigment so i'm going to angle the camera down if that's okay can you all can you see that okay thumbs up is that okay yeah, yeah. so um <clears throat> what i use is a it's a glass slab and it's got a, a slightly abrasive surface and you're, you have your muller here, glass muller, and that has an abrasive surface as well. So that all helps with the grinding of the pigment. And you can get these in different sizes, but this is quite a small one. So uh, what, what I'm doing is I'm making oil paint. So it's pure pigment plus a binder. And the binder in this instant that I'm using is cold pressed linseed oil which you can buy this is a, a litre uh, you can buy them in large quantities and there are other oils you can use but I use cold pressed lin linseed oil and today I'm, I'm going to just show you how I make the paint so I'm going to use um, a yellow ochre now I've got it in this container because sometimes, uh, for example, like this one, the pigments can come in uh, packages like this. So it's easier to decant it into um, a jar or a, a tin, whereas other ones, you know, they come in, um, already come in their plastic pots. So it's just uh, for ease, really. So <clears throat> I take, I use a palette knife. Um, just for mixing the, the um, making the paint. So we're going to take some of the the, the yellow ochre pigment, a, a decent amount. Now this is a, a lovely pigment to work with, and you'll find that they're all different. The pigments are all different. The same with paints, um, and they all behave differently when you're making them. Um, and how I add the oil is I use a pipette and in this way you, you're in control. You can control the amount of oil you're, you're adding. So we start off with a, a, a little bit of oil and use the palette knife. So usually when you've got a, a decent amount of pigment you can make a well in the middle and with the palette knife and just start it off and then we can start using the muller and start working it in now this clearly needs um, more oil and you get to know the more you do it how much or, li or little of oil to add and, and when you're making the paint you're in control so by that i mean with a tube of paint you're given what what you've got they've already mixed it up and you'll find that there's like a, a blodge of oil at the top of a tube of paint well the beauty of this is you can make it as thick consistency or as thin as you require so i'm going to add some more oil here it will get going eventually you just got to be patient and then this process you're 
really getting to know this particular colour, this particular pigment and the feel of it. So as you start working it in, I work with a figure of eight and I'm, and I'm thinking about this colour and how I'm going to use this in the particular painting or paintings I'm working on at, at the moment. And yes, it takes time, but it's really rewarding at the end of it. And so really working up. You can you can use more paint at a time or less. And I tend to mix up what I require at the time. Um, so I'm using the palette knife just to remove this from the muller. Now this is becoming like now a butter, a buttery consistency. You see, and you can still see the grains slightly of the the pigment. Now this you could use this now. This is um, you see how quick it is as well, but it's still a bit grainy. So it depends on what your the res end result you're, you require for what you're, you're wanting to say, wanting, wanting to achieve in your painting at, or paintings at the time. So I'm going to keep working this just to show you. And so here it goes. Quite phys it can get quite physical and you're really working it in. So we're doing this figure of eight so that you're using up all the pigment, all the paint. And it's smoothing out a bit more now. So let's take this off and let's say, okay, we want it to be, we don't want it to be buttery. We want it to be like a, a cake mixture. So we're going to add a few more drops of the oil. And how, long does, now, how long does it last for? On, on your palette. Well, just generally, does it have a similar shelf life to a, a, a shop-bought tube of... Oh, yes. If you wanted it to last longer, then you can fill, you can get these empty tubes like this, and you can make your own tubes yourself and fill that and then seal it, and then, yes, it, it won't dry out and it will last longer. I, I don't tend to do that. I, as I say, I tend to make up as, as much as I need at the time. And sometimes, depending on, on the pigment, you can leave it on your palette overnight and it doesn't dry out. But, but other, pet, uh, other pigments do. It just really depends on, uh, you know, what, you're, what pigment you're using at the time. And, and there again, you do get to know um how how the the colors behave and the earth colors like this is an earth ochre uh, can behave very differently to your spectral light colors so now here we... sorry to interrupt again what does spectral light colors mean well earth colors are from the earth so you've got your umbers and your ochres whereas your spectral light colors are your, like your violets um, you've got your lovely cerulean blue. So it's spectral, it's like in the rainbow, the colours of the rainbow. So now we have this um, more smooth, oily, um, more like cake mixture, as I call it, kind of consistency. So it's beautiful. Look at that, it's just so delicious, I find. That's smooth, lovely, ready to offer up onto the sur surface of your painting. So here you can actually see the shiny oilness. So how that changed from the buttery consistency before to now. Now you could go even further, you know, you could add more oil and make it quite runny if you wanted to. Now the way I, I paint and the way I use um, paints generally, pigments, is pure colour. I'm working with, I don't, I don't mix colours. I 
use so I will use the yellow ochre and I'll put it onto the surface and it, and it's about what is underneath that colour or what is next to it and how it affects the colour on the surface of the painting and so you, you never really get to fully know a colour because it varies in it, each painting that you're you're working on um, and the real test of a pigment comes through mixing it up yourself and you really need to experience this to 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 get the benefit because you i'm sure you know a lot of people would say oh you know it's just easy to to squirt out the chew but as i said before without repeating myself you know what you're getting now, now in some um tubes of paint you will find that uh it, it, particular in in the cheaper ones that they add extenders and fillers and also there may be more than one pigment so that then comes your hues um, so when you're working with pure color this is a really <clears throat> good way to go so that's your um yellow ochre now <laughs> here are a couple of a few paints that i've prepared earlier and if i show you now this is so i'm doing this to show you the the difference and the consistencies so this is a called a crema white and i use this the same process of just adding the oil and if you see like this it's like a chewing gum kind of sticky globule kind of pigment um slightly different to the um to the to the ochre and if I show you how the pigment can change from the powder pigment to when you add the oil. So this is the, the crema white and this is the paint when the oil is added to it. So it, it does change and the oil can darken, will darken the pigment. And I, I haven't used them for a long time, but there are other oils you can use. So this is a poppy oil. So you see it is lighter and it's, it's thinner. And this is a, a walnut oil. So, and, and there are a number of others as well. Um, it's just that I have concentrated on using the cold pressed linseed oil. And I, an, another colour that I'm using at the moment is beautiful. It's, it, it's quite an unusual um pigment this is called buff titanium and there again this is quite um buttery cake like you can see that and i'll show you the the powder pigment now this is um very inexpensive kilo 11 pounds 15 so that's why i've got a lot of it um, <laughs> and it's really useful um color to use and here's the powder pigment here yeah, so really good and when you add it onto a painting I'll have to show you in a minute it can look quite it can behave quite pinky it sort of changes color and that is due to the color next to it and I'm using at the moment in one of my paintings this beautiful ultramarine pink now there's a story behind this because <laughs> I ordered the ultramarine pink and I was, I was, I'm working in like uh, cool colours, pastel colours and I saw this pigment, look at that, And but when you add the oil it's become so much darker and this happened to, um, I'll show you an example of it in a moment, I, I sourced a turquoise green, this lovely turquoise green. I thought, oh yeah, I could use this a lot with the whites that I'm using, the cremo whites, the zinc white. And when I mixed it up, and I'll show you in my painting now, and offered it up, that turquoise green, you can see, is this, this green here. And how much darker, because I thought it was going to work really subtly um, and lighter, paler with, with these colours. 
But this is what happens, you see. Surprises happen. Now, this painting I'm showing you here I'm, I'm, is still to be resolved. I'm working on it at the moment. Um, and but what I'd like to show you is this is the ultramarine pink, which is the ground colour I use. So a, a colour I put all over the, the canvas to begin with. And over the top, I've put the buff titanium, which I showed you uh, just now that I, I made. And what's interesting is what this pink, ultramarine pink, is doing underneath to that buff titanium. And before I did this, I, I only had one thin layer of pink and the buff looked quite like flat and so I thought right I'm going to go back on top with the pink and then back on top with the buff titanium and it's really brought it alive and it's given form and shape to it and but of course there's your, the dilemma of um, how much do you, do you show through so I've got slivers of the pink coming through so I was uh, quite pleased with that so also I'd like to show you the surface of this, the yellow ochre, the possibilities of that yellow ochre that I've just made up. And I don't know if you can see, it's quite a coarse, rough surface, which is great. But this is probably three layers of that yellow ochre, maybe four. So I, I layer it up until I got what I the look, the feel that I'm trying to achieve. And these, this here, all through here, this is that crema white that I showed you. And there again, behaves quite strangely, you know, in places it's quite shiny um, and in other places it's quite matte. And so each time you're probably, without realising it, varying the amount of oil you're adding. But I quite like that. You know, you, you get the difference between just the slightly shiny, slightly matte areas. Um, and I've just, you know, it's surprising, exciting. And other, other times it can be not what you, what you want. So um, if I could just show you as well on here, um, there again, this um, yellow ochre that we made, the surface, and the slight difference here between you can you see this is a bit more shiny than here and that's because I had this orange or titanium orange underneath so that orange titanium went to there decided I didn't want that as orange so I put the ochre on top and it's just changed it slightly it's just a subtlety of, of, of difference in the colour so there again there's this painting all pigments apart from this pink which is a titanium and no, a titan I think they call it pink which was from the tube um, quite difficult to source a pink pigment actually so you know sort of get to go with, with the tube which is fine you know there's a place for both um, okay so uh, I think I'll probably share my screen now. I don't know how we're doing for time. Is that okay if I share my screen? Yeah, uh, I'll show you some more examples now. Um, can, can, I, can I ask you a question? Of course, yeah. Is that kind of accident or, you know, not knowing exactly what it's going to look like? Is that a really important aspect of your process? Yes, yes, I, I, I think so. I think it... It kind of um, it mixes it up a bit, you know. It, it's um, you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, sometimes it it doesn't work to my advantage, but it's okay because you can paint over it and it becomes part of the work, and that's what gives it the depth and the depth of colour because of what you know the history of what's underneath. Mm. So, so yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to share my screen just to show you a few more examples of how I use um, 
these pigments and paints on different surfaces. Now, I'm going to, if you don't mind, um, keep the uh, screen as it is so that I can use the arrow to just explain what I'm, I'm talking about. So, um, what I, some of the paintings I use, I, I make the uh, plywood panels and I, I size, as I men mentioned the gessoed panel just now, so I prepare the surface and I make the size from rabbit skin glue and this is to seal the surface of the plywood and then go on top with probably about four or five layers of gesso which is the size um, and you add, well I add whiting, you can add um, uh, different things but whiting is what I use and then as you saw um, you get this lovely cream surface which you're ready to, to paint on and this is an example of um, three plywood panels and uh, which I bolt together to make one large painting and this is all paint with pigments I think apart from this pink here this was from the tube um, I got an up close uh, image here so you can see how the pigments behave slightly differently in the surface you get with this. So this is a lovely copper blue. Um, it, it's not cheap. Uh, I think a kilo was it was that was thirty pounds, but it's a really good colour. And this is a Colbert turquoise which I laid on top of the copper blue. And you can see with the pink, the surface, the, the, it's the plywood. The, I, I love the grain of the wood, working with the grain of the wood with the paint. Um, it's really, really good. And there's another detail of this painting just to show you the subtle differences of the pinks and the reds with this beautiful Colbert violet here, just to give it that extra lift and a sliver through here. Um, now this is um, a painting on uh, canvas and just to show you an example of uh, another way I, I begin, um, it's from the drawing so most of the works I make are from translated from drawings and this drawing would be put away quite quickly and here is uh, yellow ochre again and this is the ground colour with this um, other yellow and I don't know if you can just see there's like lines that I've created just to give it an extra structure really I've just I was, went through a period of doing that with with the work because this these are rocks and a rock surface so I'm trying to give it that extra visceral um, feel so you've got many layers of paint on here and this copper blue featuring again so that's a ground colour there to make this painting um, which has just been in the Beat Painting Prize in uh, Swansea and it's um, a big one 200 by 150 centimetres and thinking about working with yellow this is a yellow painting and trying to limit the palette and working with uh, fewer colours. And you can see the uh, down here, probably just see the, that copper blue just coming through um, under the, the yellow there. And this is a better paint photo here. So this is a, a nickel titanium yellow that I'm using over the top of the uh, copper blue, which was quite, quite nice. And the, the, you see the surface, the texture of that is very different again. That, that's quite like oily, uh, very difficult to mix up actually this one. I don't really know why, some are easier than others. Some are quite grainy, some are quite oily. Oh, this is just a fun one. <laughs> um, and there's, I, I happened to, with what I was wearing that day blend into my painting, so there you go. <laughs> um, and if we move on to the 
the works I'm making at the moment and using the palette that I showed you some of the colours. Uh, this, I didn't actually show, I made up this. This is in a beautiful emerald green. Really lovely colour, dominant colour. But underneath, I've laid down an ultramarine light from pigment uh, just to, to kind of, I don't know, it, it did something, it needed that underneath the green. It was a bit flat otherwise, quite a large area. And here, this is a slate grey which really, I felt, grounded it and gave it an anchor to the painting. Um, now, so this is on plywood, and this is a detail of, of that painting. And underneath, so the ground colour of this was Mars, a Mars red, and just sort of slithers of it coming through this buff titanium, uh, many layers of buff titanium to give it that you know, movement, rhythm of the, the mountain behind. And these are all from pigment, apart from the pink. Again, that's a, a Titan buff, I think, pink. Um, and next one in the series, then this is on canvas. Um, and it's using a similar palette. And here's this, this Crema white again. And I've applied it very differently this time. It's more about the, the direction of the brush and it's quite a long rounded brush. And over many layers, it, it really went on in, in these like lines and it had a, a gray, this gray here underneath and I, in places, because you can see that just coming through there with this lovely zinc white. Uh, you don't need too much. White is very dominant, as you probably know. And there we are, that's buff titanium there, just to give it a bit of, um, you know, structure, a bit of grinding, I, I've, and, a, and a bit of copper blue here. Just You just need a little going through there. Um, and I, this is on a, a King's Blue Light Ground, which is Michael Harding to paint. Um, I had quite a lot of that paint, so I thought, well, let's try blue ground. It was a Mars red before, and this is another light, King's Blue light ground on canvas, and slightly coming through and leaving it at the bottom, just this sliver of blue, and then a copper blue there at the bottom there with your emerald green. I think this is the one I showed you just now that's on the wall. And um, I've, I've just put, in, put this one in as well because this is on um, a different surface. So we have, um, it's a smaller one, but it's canvas on board. And I did actually stain the canvas in places with this blue. So that was quite nice, sort of, keep, sort of coming through there. And this, you know, obviously is a red painting and I was experimenting with a limited colour palette of, of uh, I think it was the spectral reds, um, mid-red, with the dark, the, this was, oh no, this one down here, this is Rose Madder, and well, it was so difficult, it's very, very grainy, and it, it just kept falling off, so <laughs> it was a bit patchy, but it kind of worked, what was left of it, so, and I, I, I haven't used it again, so that wasn't a very good experience, but I think it works in the painting. Um, and also, I, I love working on paper, um, this is just an example of the ground on the paper, and the paper is um, cardi handmade paper and this is um, a 640 GSM weight so it, it, it really suits what I do because it takes so much paint and it's got this lovely deckled edge and I and how I work is I put this ground so this is um, bohemian earth green um, on top probably of a I think it was a buff titanium and I, I made a series of um, these works on paper and uh, really like trying out my colour palette. So I put this on here, spectral light, light reds, just to see how they behave together without adding any other colour. 
So it's kind of like an experiment really with this motif of my rocks in the middle. Um, and then I, I got out all my, a number of my light yellows and just see what happens and how trying to understand a colour, a pigment and how they, they sit on the surface with other, other yellows really. Um, and they, they, it turns out quite well, I think. Um, this is a mid-earth light yellows. Um, and it really informs, I find, other works. So you can select, see how they work together. And then, you know, you have a lighter yellow with a mid-yellow. Um, and you've got it there like a, a, as a reference, I find. Um, uh, a question. Have you, have you, have you ever um, sort of foraged for your own pigments? Have you ever made your own? Uh, yes, well, on my MA, um, I did, and um, I went, whilst I was uh, doing my MA, I went to um, the Isle of Skye, and I did bring back some of the earth then, <laughs> so, but I haven't worked lately um, with, with that, but um, no, it, it is a, a good thing to do, because then the work is not just about the place, it's from the place as well. But there, it, it, there is a process of cleaning the earth and washing it and sieving it. So, you know, there's, there's a quite a, um, a process to that. So, so yes, I have touched on that. Um, can I ask a question as well, actually? Sorry, just going to go at two. Um, I'm finding it fascinating, all, all of this. It sounds great. And I was actually <laughs> going to ask about the foraging paints as well. Um, but I was, wondering, I was wondering in terms of like the, um, what the pigments are made of and whether there's like a, a better sustainability or, in, in terms of not having the added additives and stuff? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I, I, I guess the earth, the earth pigments are your most natural pigments. Um, and the other ones, um, I, don't, I don't really know. That's the, the answer, what is, what is in them. Um, I can only really speak for the earth colours, but, but they are quite toxic. So, mm. um, you know, some of them do come with a hazardous warning, you know, about inhaling them and, and things like that. So, yeah, they, they can be quite toxic. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. They're probably... Well, you've got lead white, haven't you? And chromium yeah. and... I know. Elements like that. I mean, there's some pretty heavy stuff in there. I was yeah. going to say, Claire, have you, have you, are you familiar with um, Maria Lalic? Yeah, she was my tutor, actually. Yeah, because obviously she actually went to the source, didn't she? So she, like Van Dyke Brown, is yeah. from a particular place. I think is, is in Holland or wherever, you know, and she actually went to the place where that paint is made, mm. excavated the land and like decanted it, took it back, brought it back to a studio and then made a pigment and then made a painting from it. I know. Um, I mean, she... her practice is really, I think is really akin to yours, isn't it? It must be. Yes. And she's uh... so fastidious and dedicated to oh, no, yeah. coolness. And, you know, it was, it was a particular brush for a pigment, you know, and, and she had oh, no. touches and you couldn't even have a tinge of anything else. And yeah, it was, you know, yeah. Was pure colour. <laughs> I invited myself around to her studio and her face just dropped. She was just like, there's no way on earth you're coming to my studio. She said, she, you might, she actually said this to me. She said, you might ruin three months worth of work. I know. You know, it was like, there was no way I was going to get in there for love nor money. She was very, was great. Very great. Yeah, a very particular way of working. Um, but no, yeah. well, thank you for the reminder because, um, well, maybe, you know, this is my way forward, you know, to start <laughs> digging up some of the earth from where I go, you know, really. Yeah. Um, because you kind of um that's what you find this, get into a groove of, of working, don't you, away. And you almost need reminders of what else you can do. Do you all yeah. find that? You know, you, you kind yeah. of it becomes habit, doesn't it? And you sort of get so like into what you do and, and you need someone sometimes to come on, well how about this? And oh yeah to do that yeah <laughs> it's, it's a bit like looking at artists work isn't it you know you you forget some of them and there's so many you reference and then you think oh yeah i used to look at artists a lot you know <laughs> i think i think as well i think like you know obviously you know you make your own substrate and i think 
you know, but then obviously you're taking it a stage further in that you're actually making your own paint. You know, <laughs> I think for me, there was a quite a big thing where I started making my own canvases and it totally changed the way that I would attack a canvas because there's a kind of respect value there. And obviously with you, you're taking it on another step, which is actually you're mixing your own paints. And I think, you know, that's your own pigment, you know, you, it's, I think that totally changes the way that you engage and, you know, it's a fundamental part of the process, isn't it? Yes. And I hope that using these paints in, like I say, the pureness, of yeah. it, it's, you know, makes them bold and vibrant and um, quite, you know, it's lush, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think it's... What, what do you thin your, <laughs> without getting too technical, what do you thin your paints with? I mean, beyond linseed oil, if you wanted to thin it right down, what kind of solvent would you use or... Well, I, I guess I would use Terps, but... Right. Um, and I did use, um, when I was doing my MA, uh, you could add like Damar varnish, um, is it yeah. Damar, um, to make it like into a, a wash, like a thin, but... Yeah. I, I, you know, I, lately, you know, for the last few years, I'm just, I don't use anything, you know, it's just the binder. Yeah. Um, um it kind of works for me um you know yes there's lots of other things you can do um and, and there is no right or wrong you know it's just what just i'm just working through this at the moment you know and i'm really guess we're trying to get to know and understand color you know color as you know it's it's a huge subject and you know i'm just beginning i i feel and there are so many colors so many pigments um, to learn, you know, you need to learn to work with them, don't you, and how they, they work. And, and also with this, you know, working with a limited palette, um, it, it's very challenging. Um, it's great, it's really rewarding, but, you know, it's um, to pare things down, it, it's, it is challenging. And that's what I find is, you know, really interesting, you know, what you can achieve with a very limited palette. It's remarkable, really. Well, can I jump in quickly? Because we've got three minutes left before we need to finish. Um, could you just talk for a moment about the relationship between um, your subject matter, which um, is landscape, or very particular landscapes, and your process? Um, the relationship between... Well, yeah, and the reason that you, like, you know, we were talking about, you know, whether it would be if you, when you used pigment from the place, like it becomes... I see what you mean, yeah. Well, when I'm in a place, um, I'm, I'm always drawing. Um, you know, I, I get this overwhelming feeling of I need to draw what I'm looking at. And from my drawing, because I've lately I've been making line drawings, and from the line I feel the colour and feel when I'm in a place what you know what colours I'd like to use and making the line drawings is a really good memory of that felt response when I'm there so that is I would say the, the relationship rather than relying on the photograph I rely on the drawing Veronica, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm, it's been lovely hearing about you talk about how you, your choices you make in terms of the colours and the layering, what comes up against each other. Just nice hearing that sort of talk. Thank you. But I'm also, what I'm wondering is um, about, you said about you use um, linseed as your binder rather than poppy or walnut. Is there a particular reason for that? Uh, do the others do something different? Yes. Um, I think there's a richness and a certain quality to the linseed oil. Um, it's, it's definitely darker, um, but I, it's just the way I sort of got hold of it and, and I've, I've kind of run with it. There's no really right. reason. I, <laughs> um, I've only touched on the others, you know, just from experimenting, you know, um, when I was doing my studying. So... No, I can't, there's, there's no other reason than that, really. 
may, maybe I should do some more experimenting again. <laughs> uh, um, does anyone else have any questions for Claire? Um, sorry, we haven't got through all of your slides, Claire. Uh, sorry, well, it was that start, wasn't it? It was a, sorry, it was, it wasn't a very good start. You want to quickly whiz through them while... Yeah. Well, I, well I, I wasn't going to, you know, I was just going to show a few more. Um, this works on paper. Um, just example of how you use the paint a bit, a bit more thinly. Um, what's this one? Detail of that one. Um, I just had some as reserve, really. So, yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask something? Yes. Hi, Claire. It's John Wyatt Clark. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Uh, about your drawings, you had a massive drawing on your wall that looked like a studio drawing. Yes. Uh, how do you, what's, what's the, the steps between studio drawing up, you know, from in the place drawing up to studio drawing up to painting? I um, wonder what you went through. Yeah, well, uh, on location, um, you know, on <laughs> sketchbook drawing like this, a, a4, a4, a5, you know, that's in the place, and then um, and and they're in pencil, uh, more typically when I when I go outside like that, and then um, I select the ones that I feel you know have got something <laughs> I want to explore, and so then yes, I've scaled them up, and and I've been using charcoal pencil for that. Yeah. And so that's the step, and then and then it. They don't all you always do that things. between the uh, draw between the sketchbook and the painting. There's always that interim. Uh, lately, I have yes, uh, because yeah. I, I'm wanting to expand my drawing skills. I think that's uh. what, what I've been doing. And also, I will say, it's a bit of a light relief. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's more instant, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. it's you know. And, and it, does the tone suggest the colour? Is that what you were saying? Well. The line, because there, there have been line drawings. So yes, I'm I'm thinking about the colour then. Um, so I'm, I'm get, I guess it, it really helps, you know, with this the process. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it is lovely to draw. I, you know, it's a big big part of what I do is the drawing. Um, yeah. you know, all the thoughts come from the drawing, inspired painting, and the painting's more emotional. I would say the colour, mm. emotion. Um, yeah. No, it makes sense to make that's a big jump and just like dividing it in half by putting a big drawing in the middle is really smart. <laughs> well, you, yes, but really, I I should put them away more quickly because they can they can interfere with the painting because the painting is something else. It becomes mm. its own. Um, it's very different to the drawing. I, I if I've got a really successful drawing. I want that that in the painting, but oh god, yeah, <laughs> it changes as you can appreciate. So it really they really should go away more quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, I think we're going to have to end it there, unfortunately. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm very thank sorry about the start, but oh, don't worry. Thank you all for. I hope you find some of that. Fantastic, thanks very much. Really great, thank you. Oh, really great, thank you. Thank you. I hope to speak to you again. And, um, if you want to join us next, for the next two weeks, we have painters, as I mentioned earlier, two more painting talks. Um, next week, James Mortimer being eaten alive, and then the following week, Steve, who is talking about his uh, work looking at the uh, council estate he grew up on in Deptford and how it translates into paint. All right, thanks very much. Bye. 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 Thank you.